so let me start by trying to give you a definition for mysticism to begin with. And I haven't used this one before, but I, I think it'll work. Mysticism in, is when God's presence becomes experiential for you. Not intellectual, experiential. And undoubted, undoubted. And that's why you see this kind of courage and self-confidence in the mystics. They have no doubt when they're talking. They're, they're not talking about belief systems. They're saying, I know. <laughs> I know this to be the case. And that's what puts them in such an extraordinary category, a very different category. Most of us believe things because our church has told us to believe them, and we don't want to be disobedient members of the church, so we say, I believe, as we do in the creed. But a mystic doesn't say, I believe. They say, I know. This is the way it is. <laughs> and a true mystic will ironically speak with that self-confidence, but simultaneously with a kind of humility that uh, this is the only way I can say it. I know it's true. Now, maybe you'll say it differently. Maybe you'll see it differently because there's many angles of looking at this same great mystery. So when you see that combination of a kind of calm self-confidence, certitude, and humility all at the same time, I think you have the basis for mysticism in general. Now, up to 1200, most of the mystics would have been identified with the early desert fathers and mothers of Egypt and, and Syria and Palestine. Uh, then it moves into the, the monasteries. So we have monastic mysticism. Becomes academic very often, trying to explain it. And the, the change of place that Francis is going to achieve is he's going to bring it from the monasteries to the streets. And that's why I use that quote. Why he says, don't speak to me of Benedict and Augustine. I've got a different way. And so we were not called monks. I know people look at this habit and think we're monks. But we were called friars. And a friar was one who mixed with the people in the city, a part of everybody else's life, and did not separate himself from uh, their life because that's where it was happening. So you've got to realize that's the beginning of this alternative orthodoxy. That the emphasis now is not going to be on academia. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And we move there quick enough. But uh, we never lost the initial spark from that genius himself, uh, Francis, who simply lived it in a way of lifestyle. He didn't talk about it as much as he did it. And so the next generation come and they just look at him and ask, uh, what was he doing? Now, uh, we've quoted, I think, in these webcasts before that, that first piece of Italian poetry called the Canticle to Brother Son. And I just want to point out one thing. It was written by Francis around 1225, shortly before he died. But uh, he starts by saying, all praise, O God, is yours. It's already uh, going towards you. Then the second says, but we don't know how, we're not worthy enough to recognize this, to name this, to speak of this. And then he starts listing all of the elements of creation and says, let these things in themselves give you praise. Starting with brother sun, sister moon, all the animals, all the elements. Now, that might not strike you as, as too unusual. But here's what's happening. Grace is moving from something you ask for from the heavens. Most pictures of people waiting for the Holy Spirit, they're looking upward. They have their hands out, and that's good, or their hands raised. The assumption being, geometrically, is that the Spirit is up there. You understand? <laughs> if you ever go to Assisi in the great basilica where he's buried, in complete disobedience to our rule where he said, never build a big church, well, 
As soon as he died, we built a big church in his honor, of course, because now the rules are different. And that, that's what happens when you, when you worship somebody instead of follow somebody. Uh, but anyway, in the, in the upper church, off to the left-hand chapel, there's a little statue that uh, bronze that most people don't necessarily note. And it's Francis uh, honoring the Holy Spirit. And the posture and the perspective is completely different. It's not this. He's looking down into the ground. <laughs> what no, and he's got his hands folded, looking into the earth. <laughs> You've, this is the beginning of an alternative orthodoxy. Actually, I would say as a Christian, it's the movement of the incarnation. <laughs> uh, Jesus who emptied himself and became flesh. Uh, and Francis recognized and took to the, the final point, the implications of the incarnation. If God became flesh in Jesus, if God entered the world in Jesus, then it was the world. <laughs> it was the physical. It was the animal. It was the elements. It was sexuality. It was embodiment. It was physicality. Use whatever word you want. But these were the hiding places of God. These were the revelation places of God. You've got to realize that changes everything. Now, to immediately jump to those first two intellectuals, uh, St. Bonaventure, who lived shortly after him, an Italian, and John Duns Scotus, an Englishman, they both were supreme intellectuals. And they observed what he was seeing, what he was doing, that he found the transcendent not out there but in here the transcendent within. So you realize what that, what's happening is grace is now inherent. <laughs> grace is not something you invite into the world as if it's not already there. This becomes why we never had any trouble with evolution, for example. I mean, I don't know why people have trouble with evolution. Uh, it's because they don't believe grace is inherent. <laughs> And so you've got, to, you've got to have God doing everything from outside, ad extra, we said in Latin. No, it's ad intra. It's from inside that life is, from the very beginning, generated. Brothers and sisters, if you, if you spiritually realize, and I do mean realize, it's not just a matter of intellectually agreeing with me. Once that becomes a spiritual realization, life is very, very different. Now, both Bonaventure and Scotus developed a doctrine, I'm going to give you a big word, don't be daunted by it, called, uh, that we eventually called, well, Scotus called it, the university of being. You don't have to remember it, but let me explain it for you, all right? Up to that point, the philosophers said God was a being, a being, and everything else participated in being analogously, by analogy, but not really. <laughs> what, what the Franciscan tradition believed was the univocity of being. Univocity in Latin means one voice, right? One voice. That when you speak of God, when you speak of angels, when you speak of humans, when you speak of animals, when you speak of trees, when you speak of fish, when you speak of the earth, you are speak using the word being uni univocally, <laughs> with one voice. They all participate in being. <laughs> and being is one. Now, that might seem like an abstract philosophical position, but I hope you can see how that creates an inclusive universe where everything is sacred, where you can't divide the world into the sacred and the profane anymore. It's over. <laughs> and yet, most Christians to this day, in what was called the mainline orthodoxy, <laughs> still, uh, most Christians I meet, Catholic and Protestant, still have the world divided into the sacred and the profane. Uh, and there's good things and there's bad things. Let me read a few quotes from Bonaventure. Uh, uh, these are all from his, the soul's journey to God. He says, Whoever, therefore, is not enlightened by such splendor of the created world is blind. 
Whoever is not awakened by such outcries is deaf. Whoever does not praise God because of these effects is dumb. Whoever does not discover the first principle from which all these clear signs come is a fool. Open your eyes, alert the ears of your spirit, open your lips and apply your heart so that in all creatures, all creatures, uh, I'm going to point out how often the word all is used. We don't have exclusionary Christianity in early Franciscanism. It's one world. And that's why he can go to the Muslim world in the 13th century, which was not common, <laughs> as it wouldn't be today, and call the Muslim people his brothers and sisters. Because <laughs> it, it's all, it's an inclusive vision. In all creatures you may see, hear, praise, love, worship, glorify, and honor God. If you do not do this, the whole world will rise against you. He's, of course, paralleling Jesus' own phrase that the stones will cry out. So uh, Bonaventure's definition of God, by his power, presence, and essence, he is the one whose center is everywhere and his circumference, I don't mean God is masculine by using his, but it's just easier. You don't want to say it's, you know. Uh, by his, and Bonaventure still uses the masculine term. By his power, presence, and essence, God's center is everywhere, God's circumference is nowhere, and God exists uncircumscribed. I know these are big words, but <laughs> uncircumscribed in everything. You, you realize it's one world now. <laughs> it's, uh, you can find God everywhere. You don't have to go to monasteries. In the first pages of my bachelor's thesis, I quote Francis saying, don't build monasteries. You know, our cloister is the world. Hmm? The world as it is. So a couple more wonderful quotes. God is therefore all-inclusive. God is the essence of everything. God is most perfect and immense, within all things but not enclosed, outside all things but not excluded, above all things but not aloof, below all things but not debased. Finally, therefore, this God is all in all, quoting 1 Corinthians 15:28. Consequently, from him, through him, and in him, all things exist. Now, maybe you already sort of believe that. I hope you do. But the implications of that have not really been carried through by most Christians. Let's see. Okay, and then he finally gives us his guidance for how we are to approach this search for God. Little importance should be given to inquiry. Now, here he is, a big intellectual teaching at Paris himself. So this is sort of him critiquing himself. Little importance should be given to inquiry, but much to unction, inner feeling. Little importance should be given to the tongue, what you say, but much to inner joy. Little importance should be given to words and to writing, which is exactly what he's doing, of course, but to the very gifts of the Holy Spirit that are within all things. If you wish to know this God, ask for grace, not instruction. Ask for desire, not understanding. Ask for the groanings of prayer, not diligent reading. Seek the spouse, not just the teacher. Can you feel the difference? I want a lover. I just don't want a, uh, a God as a first principle. Seek a darkness, not clarity. Oh, now that's not the way we think, is it? So, because we don't think that way anymore is why most Christianity has become fundamentalist. It wants absolute certainty about everything, all the time, everywhere. He wants to know who's going to heaven and who isn't, who's right, who's wrong, who God loves, who doesn't love, and it, it's certain. 
That's why fundamentalist Christians are not much fun to be around. Because hmm? they're, they're just excluding all the time who isn't saved, who isn't worthy, who isn't right, who God doesn't love. Brothers and sisters, this is the Christianity that is passing as Christianity today. I mean, this is what most people think is the real deal. And we, from our position, say, how did we miss it? How did we get it so long? Because in many ways, we were not the main line. We were always sort of a subtext within the larger world of, of Catholic Christianity. But I wanted to throw that big idea of univocity of being, first of all. It might seem philosophical, but now let me move into the implications of that. If incarnation is the big thing, we are, you know, the ones who really popularized Christmas, right? That, you can blame the Franciscans for that. Christmas was not a big thing. It was Easter, the first thousand years of the church. But for Francis... If the incarnation was true, then Easter took care of itself. I just wrote a book on resurrection. So resurrection is simply incarnation coming to its logical conclusion. You follow me? If God is already in everything, then everything is unto glory. <laughs> and so the early friars didn't have any trouble with what we, many would now call universal salvation. We're all saved by mercy. God alone is good. <laughs> We're all saved by grace. And so there's no point in distinguishing degrees of worthiness because God alone is all good and everything else in creation merely participates in that goodness. So the first implication of the incarnation, which you can see is create, going to create a, a, a universal foundation for universal mysticism, is the two adjectives most applied to God by Franciscan mysticism were goodness, which probably doesn't surprise you, but it isn't always typical. The goodness of God, the all goodness of God. And the second one, this is the surprising one, that hardly any other mainline Christian popularizes to the degree of Francis. The humility of God. Now, I bet if I'd ask almost any of you, what is the first adjective you would apply to God? Hardly any of us would say God is humble. <laughs> Francis did. He fell in love with the humility of God. Because if God emptied himself and hid himself inside of the material world, then God for Francis, revealed in Jesus, of course, was very, very humble. And so that determines his whole life. He just wanted to be the most humble man around because only in that humble human state could he find God because that's where God had gone and Francis wanted to go where Jesus went and where God was hiding. So uh, what we have, therefore, you can see the basis for a different kind of mysticism it's not God from above. It's God from within. It's not churchiness. Now, uh, we were, except through one early movement called the spirituals, we weren't really anti-church, but we were sort of para-church. <laughs> and you, uh, if you've ever been to Assisi, a few of us get to go there next month, where I'm going to be teaching some of this again on site. Uh, you'll, you'll go to the old walled city of Assisi and still standing are the churches that would have been there when Francis was alive. San Rufino, the cathedral, San Giorgio, the Benedictine church, and the, the parish churches of St. Nicholas and San Stefano. Uh, but outside the walls, there were two ruined churches that were literally falling apart. One is called San Damiano, and one is called St. Mary of the Angels. We know historically, factually, Francis of Assisi rebuilt those churches. So when you go and you see the top stones, you actually know he put them in there himself. And so his life becomes a parable of rebuilding of the church. 
from the first image he has in San Damiano, where he claims the cross spoke to him. And he says, this is what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, go rebuild my church, for you see it is falling into ruins. Now, of course, literalist that he is at that point, he's just 19 or 20 years old, he, uh, he goes and buys stone and s thinks Jesus wants him to rebuild a physical building. And we're glad that he did. But only in time did we come to recognize that Jesus himself was saying, my church is in ruins. <laughs> so this seems to have always been the case. <laughs> this isn't just something now in our lifetime. And it's Francis who, who, with this joyous incarnational spirituality, still believes in building up reality from the bottom up. But he doesn't do it in a churchy way. Do you understand? It's more cosmic Christianity. Uh, and that's why Duns Scotus, uh, who builds on this, his image of Christ is not the historical Jesus, but the Christ of Colossians, Ephesians, who existed from all eternity and is founded in the very universe. Uh, it's, it's much bigger than church. It's cosmic Christianity more than church Christianity. Can you see how that's an alternative orthodoxy? And we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but what the early Franciscan tradition did was just emphasize some very different things. It had different starting points. And because you have a different starting point, you end up having a different spirituality. Huh? And usually a different ending point, too. So Jesus, uh, Francis fell in love with the humanity of Jesus. Not so much the divinity. It was his humanity that he wanted to draw close to. So you can see everything moves it down to what's called the lower level, but it really isn't the lower level at all. It's the level of incarnation. Now, uh, any of you who are students of art, and this by students of art has been documented, uh, particularly exemplified by Giotto. If you go to the great church in Assisi, art itself changes after Francis. And before that, you have glorious, divine icons. God is transcendent beyond in the heavens. And art itself really is the beginnings of the Renaissance. Art itself moves to a fascination with little birds and little squirrels. Those weren't painted before the 13th century. You don't see them. Think of that. Go, go to your art. You wouldn't paint a squirrel. <laughs> Squirrels aren't worth anything. Do you understand? We just paint icons, you know? <laughs> Everything is only transcendent divine God. Francis, it's, he's like he switches the camera <laughs> to a different direction and says, let's look here for God. That's why, in a word, mysticism became much more available and why suddenly you'll have a plethora of women mystics because now you don't have to go off and be a monk or a monastic or a nun to, or an intellectual to be a mystic. Many of the early Franciscan women are, are lay women, most of them in fact, like Angela Foligno who lives right down the road from Francis. Here's one of her lines. God loves the soul, and that God is the very love of the soul. This very God showed me by living knowledge that he himself was goodness itself. There is in my soul a chamber where the all good, notice that God is the all good one, which is not any particular good, resides in my soul. And he is so much the all good that there is no other good. And that goodness is in me. That's extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, you can see once you have the time bomb of eternal life ticking inside of you, and you don't have to beg for it, you have it. 
what, what happens in Franciscan mysticism is a matter of becoming what you already are. Got it? Not finding something that's out there, over there, beyond me. Now, Moses has already said this in Deuteronomy. He says to his Jewish compatriots, if you want to find this law of God, don't climb up to the mountain, don't go to the bottom of the sea, it is within you. So we can see this was prophesied and offered, but I, I have to say, I think for most of Christianity, that message was just too good to be true. We are so, and this is what I'm talking about in my recent book, we are so overwhelmed by our false self, by our ordinariness, by our embodiment, by our, our sinfulness, as the medievals and the biblicals would have called it. We just say, I, my, my can't do, I, I can't do all the wonderful things I want to do. We're so overwhelmed by that, that to believe that we are still temples of the Holy Spirit is just for most of us a huge leap of faith. And in fact, you can't get there without God taking you there. It's just hard for the, the mental ego to believe that. So you can see that the starting point, therefore, is not sin and the overcoming of sin. Now this is where Scotus shines most brightly. For Christian history up to this point, Jesus came as the Savior from sin. In other, and Scotus looked at that and he said, well, then Jesus is just a problem solver. <laughs> he, he's just a mop-up exercise. <laughs> he just comes to, to, to wash up what we did wrong. No, no. He says, this, this Christ is written in creation from the very beginning. He calls it the first idea in the mind of God is Christ. Huh? To plant himself in the material world. And so you see... This idea that Matthew Fox, a Dominican, God bless him, beautifully called original blessing, that we don't start with original sin, we start with original blessing. God created it and it was good. God created it and it was good. The problem is already solved in the first chapter of Genesis. It says five times in a row, it was good, it was good, it was very good. Uh, so we, but for some damn reason, and I use the word damn intentionally, we spent most of our time concentrating on what went wrong with the original goodness. And Jesus was just a problem solver. We had no cosmic Christ. Jesus just came as a necessary healer of our problem. And we were all grateful to Jesus for doing this, but the Christ mystery was no longer organic, cosmic, inherent, part of the deal from the very beginning. So uh, our starting point is not sin, therefore our, our starting point is in incarnation itself. Our ending point is inevitable and predictable, it's resurrection. <laughs> that God will lead all things to their glorious conclusion, despite the crucifixions in between. And for him, Jesus became that living icon of the whole journey, uh, what Carl Jung later calls the, the archetype of the soul, the image of the necessary stages that the soul must go through.